All right. Testing one, two, three. That'll be a little better. All right, cool. Maybe? Is there a better angle here? Hang on. Well, it looks better because I'm not looking up your nose. Hold on a second. Is that, that's... That's worse. Yeah, I mean, for me, but... Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing over there, really. We can just do this. Yeah, that's fine. And maybe I can... Hang on. Let me try this for a second and see if we can get, like, that there. And that coming in there. Is that a Yeti microphone? It's a Yeti. How, how do you get upside down like that? Like, uh, um, I've got a shock mount on it. Okay. Um, that it mounts, it mounts upwards into the shock mount. Uh -huh. So it's like suspended on an elastic, which means I can tap my desk and I don't get, you know, this. Okay. That's like. Gotcha. Cool. That noise. And then I had the armature, of course. But yeah, the shock mount is the jam. Okay. I'm pretty happy with it for whatever, 150 bucks or something. Yeah. Yeah, I have one floating around here somewhere, but I. I didn't check about it like you were. Oh. <laughs> it's that. Do you know I did, I did audio before I did the web? I was an audio guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. What audio things did you do before the web? Mm. Like school, I mean. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Like, I, I, went to, I was in, in music school at Indiana University for audio recording okay. and did that a number of years. And uh, then I, I was playing in bands. And I just played in bands for like five years. Oh, that's right. You did. Yeah. About Band guy. Band, band. Is it okay to do like this sort of angle from the side for video, or should I pull it around? Uh, honestly, it's okay because not many people will be seeing the video, so it just sweet. Don't worry about the video, man. So. Well, let's let's do this so it's not just like a face full of shock mount or uh, <laughs> you know a pop filter. Yeah, but they're so great because like this, the butt butt Christopher. Mm -hmm. Please, please let me pop in this microphone. Mm. That's terrible. Yeah, face so full of shock mouth is my Smash Mouth cover band. Face full of shock <laughs> mouth. <laughs> I love it. Okay. No, this will this 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 will be good. Let's okay. do this. Okay, cool, awesome, sweet. Well, thanks for uh, jury rigging that. Hey, sure. Pretty quickly and uh, dealing with the audio and uh, video things. Sorry. No problem at all. Cool, awesome, cool. Yeah, so, um, well, I want to talk to you today is about your documentary. Yeah. They're working on and just want to. Can you describe uh, the uh, overall uh, purpose of, of your documentary that you've been working on? Mm-hmm. I can do that. Okay. Probably. Okay. Okay, that's cool. I just want to make sure you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I know what it's about. Okay. I've been working on it for like two years. Yeah. If I if I don't know what it's about yet, we're in we're in trouble. Right. And it's you know it's premiering in August, so I should really <laughs> figured out the crux of the <laughs> you film. Should, you should put it down there. You should probably should write down some few things. Yeah, a couple ideas. <laughs> Just you wouldn't believe if you like if you were to search my notes, you know, on my phone or, or computer or whatever, right. my Apple notes. Yeah. That's the problem with calling them something so general is it's hard to refer to them. So if you were to search my notes mm -hmm. for like the term just the word future, right. the number of notes files that will come up with just like ideas for the movie. Yeah. Like now I really know what the movie's about. Like those files, it's like too many. <laughs> And it'll be like six months later, and I'll basically have the exact same thought, yeah. and think it's a new thought, and oh, write yeah. it down again. Oh, that's 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 sad. Like, it's and so cool. clear to me today. It's today. It's so clear what this is about. I'll write it all down. But like two months ago on a sunny day, you're like you're as clear to you. I then. had basically the exact same idea. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the, the movie's called uh, "What Comes Next Is the Future." What comes next is the future. Right. And so, how did the idea get started? Like, what... well, uh. uh it started, it started through uh, opportunity, I suppose. So there were, there were a few factors that came together at the same time. One was that I, was, I, I just started feeling like it was a really interesting time on the web with um, mobile changing so rapidly. So this would, gosh, when did I start doing this? So I guess about 
two, two and a half years ago, something like that, um, before the Kickstarter. Um, so this is 2016, right? So let's say 2013, 2014. Um, I just was feeling like the mobile thing, of course, was just crazier and crazier every day. And um, res- responsive design was making things really interesting again. Um, since 2010, when, you know, when Ethan unveiled his concoction of things. So I felt like there's a lot to talk about in, in web design that it felt really interesting and like just a really cool time. It just felt like one of the, it started to feel to me like, you know, 20 years from now or 30 years from now, I'm going to look back and say, man, wasn't that great. That was such a neat time in web design. So there was that, there's that sort of hunch that there was a lot happening that was special. And then I was getting a lot of opportunities for speaking at that time, thanks to starting to write for uh, a list apart and actually talking to you as well. That that started a lot of things off. And I, because I was speaking, I was going to all these conferences and getting to talk um, with the other people who were speaking at the conferences that were in some cases heroes of mine or people I really looked up to and thought had really interesting things to say on the on those topics. And then the other was that we bought a new, at that time, new like Canon Rebel um, a, a DSLR camera that also had HD video capability and we had pretty good lenses. So I thought, okay, well, I've got this little movie camera. <laughs> I've got access to all these people and I have this thing I want to talk about. Maybe I'll just start bringing a camera along and seeing if I can talk to them for a little bit, if they'll talk to me about these subjects. And so I wrote up some general questions. Um, I didn't really know what the movie was about yet. I just knew I wanted to talk about some things. Right. And I asked them all the same general questions and I got like an okay microphone and a little tripod and I set it up and then talked to them. And with each interview, I would learn things about what I had done wrong or, you know, so I have an audio background, but I didn't have a video background. So I have a photography background. So I thought like, how hard can it be? Right. Yeah. Do still images. I can do audio. That's kind of a movie without motion. So I just I'll figure out motion. How hard can that be? It turns out like hard. <laughs> kind of hard is what it is. Um, so I, I made lots of mistakes early on and sort of with each interview, I'd come back and watch it or show it to somebody and go like, oh crap, I should have done whatever. Like my lighting sucks or, or the microphone positioning was bad or, and it, it sort of got better and better throughout them. And then I decided that to really, at some point I realized, oh, I think I'm making a documentary. <laughs> I, it's funny how long it took me to realize that I was like stitching together a documentary. Um, and at a certain point I realized I need to be able to devote more time to this, like real chunks of time. And I need better gear. I need to like buy more stuff and I can't really justify doing that from my business, um, income, you know, like most of that has to go to paying for the business and the employees and everything else. So, um, I needed a little more revenue and I needed to be able to, to really pay for myself to throw some time at it. So we did a Kickstarter, which as you're aware is the easiest and least painful of things you can do <laughs> in your life. Yeah. Um, and so I did that for the requisite amount of time to do it, the 30 days. Mm-hmm. It felt much longer. And we were somehow, like, there were, I thought it wasn't going to work. It was, it was really good, like, the first day or two. Yeah, yeah. And then it bottomed out forever. Yeah. Like, for weeks, there was, like, nothing happening. And I would, you know, we had, like, everyone in, on the web tweeting about it and posting to Facebook and blogging. And, like, everybody was trying to help. Right. And it didn't matter. I could get, like, 40 you know, web famous people to do stuff about it and it would, wouldn't move the needle at right. all. Mm. And I was sort of despairing and getting ready to give up. And then I did one last push right at the end. Yeah. I think somehow we reached 50%, like with a few days to go. Yeah. And then I found the statistic from Kickstarter is like, if you hit 50%, you're, you have a 90% chance of completing it. Yeah. So I posted that and I was like, guys, I know it seems desperate, but statistically right. nine out of 10 chance here. Right what do you say? We have a few more days. Can we make it happen? And then it just blew up. And like, everybody was like, it's the thing with Kickstarter is like, people like to start a project and they like to push it over the top, but nobody wants to just like, no one wants to do the, the work. Middle. Yeah. yeah right? Nobody wants to like be that guy, get, get it a little closer in the middle. Like that's not very fun. Right. It's not dramatic. Right. It's like carrying the Olympic flame, like the, the two weeks before they always running around, they run around the country, around all over. You're like, Hey, I'm, I'm number five guy. Right, <laughs> like who wants That's to be number five exciting. guy? Like you want to be the guy who like runs it to the guy who's supposed to light the the cauldron. You don't want to be <laughs> that guy who like, yeah, whatever. You know, you you like carried it through Ohio, 
Like yeah. nobody's like, yeah, <laughs> now we're done with Ohio. Yeah. But now it's time. Right. Pennsylvania is up next. You're right on. Do you, you run into that flat part of Ohio? Oh, you mean like most of Ohio? Like the whole most thing, of, like yeah. the Ohio. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the, it was like the Ohio. We were in Ohio for a really long time. Right. And then we got to the end and um, somehow it got kicked over the top and yeah. we got the money. So we raised about $60,000, which honestly is like not you know, money to make a movie with at right. all. Mm-hmm. Um anyone that's made a movie will probably tell you that's not enough money to make a movie, Mm -hmm. but it was something I got to buy some gear and I got to do a lot of traveling and, you know, pay for travel expenses and then a little bit of my time, but we're like way over budget right now, but that's fine. Like it, it, it justified like doing it right. The most part. Yeah. And then also I talked to you about like your guy rented RV at one point. We were going to rent an RV that turned out to be impractical. It was a really good idea except for like bringing an RV into major American cities. That was actually the hang up. Oh, really? When I realized, like, oh my God, I'd have to drive an RV into New York, oh, or I'd okay. have to like tow a car behind the RV. Oh, nice! And then I was like, no, no, I'm not going to do any of that. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to fly in an airplane <laughs> <laughs> to cities. Yeah. And so I tried. So I, because we had a limited budget, then I was hoping um, what I tried to do is condense things and find like the biggest concentrations of people mm-hmm. in urban areas. So like Austin, for instance, I came and interviewed you and a whole bunch of people in Austin, right. and I did San Francisco. Um, and I would do conferences that I was going to anyway to save money. So if I was going to a conference city, I'd see how many people I could find there right. that I wanted to interview. So we didn't get to interview everybody I wanted to from the outset, but in retrospect, that was impossible. It's too many people, but we got a really good spread. I think of people of different focuses and backgrounds and ages and, um, and everything. And it's, uh, what we ended up with, I think is a really compelling story. Um, so it's almost there. It's about 60% finally edited right i'm actually doing the editing myself i'm constructing the film through digital editing which i found is like the easiest way for me to write a script actually um it's it it harkens back to my audio experience right like cutting albums together from audio files so it's it's been really it's been really wonderful figuring it out it took a lot longer for me to figure out how i needed to do it and wanted to do it Mm -hmm. i mean i didn't expect it to take two years but now that we're almost there it makes sense to me and like i feel like i know how to put together a documentary now Um, it would be, if I could do it over again, I would have done it in half the time. Yeah. But anyhow, it's about 60% fully edited. And then the rest of it is mostly rough edited where I've got like clips and they're kind of thrown into collections by theme. Uh, and I have the theme, those chapters mapped out. So now it's just a matter of going through all those clips and ordering them and cutting out the ones that don't quite work and making that narrative flow through the middle of the film. But the beginning of the film's done, end of the film's done. There's a chunk in the middle. It's roughed out so your, right. so your themes are sort of like uh, songs on an album that you're yeah to? almost yeah. yeah they're like or chapters in a book like they should flow naturally from the beginning you know you have to have a nice intro to the film which incidentally is this guy christopher schmidt no oh. yeah you get you get to kick off the movie man oh nice man that's awesome you had a really great quote and it just perfectly sets the tone for the whole film yeah. Uh, so you know i felt i felt really lucky to have that buried in our like two hours of interviews that we did <laughs> Oh man, that's awesome. Yeah, because uh, I always knew, like, going in, like, uh, which is my fear and, like, whatever, but just, like, I'm going to be on the cutting room floor. On the floor is great. But uh, it's, it's awesome. tough. It's tough. It's been hard for me. One of the hardest things about the film, the thing that had me paralyzed a bit in the middle, was that I'm friends with uh, a lot of the people that I'm interviewing. Mm-hmm. And I was really afraid of, like, oh, I've got to get everybody in here. Like, I've got to find, and I have to make everybody look good all the time. And, like, I don't want to, you know. Uh, it became a, there was this exercise in just like trying to make my friends look good and do good things for them the whole time. Not that I make anybody look bad anymore, but I stopped worrying so much about the people um, and making sure everyone got an equal amount of time and like that kind of thing yeah. and just be nice to people and started focusing on telling the best story I can, yeah. um, which means some people get a lot of airtime because they just happen to hit the right narrative bits or they happen to flow well from the previous or next person. Right. Um, and other people get less time and some people aren't making it in at all. And it's not because they did a bad job. It's just that as the film really coalesced, you know, the documentary, it's not like a normal movie where you write the whole movie and you go shoot the movie. Right. Right. And, and, and you just tell, cause everybody has a script and they read their lines and it's done. Right. This is like, you, you have to, it's almost like carving a sculpture. You know, we start with a thing like a block of marble or whatever. I imagine. I don't know. I've, I went to art, I went to art school. I can talk about this. And you're supposed to like find the sculpture in the rock. You know that kind of. You just chip away until you find it. It's like that. Like I have to like 
go out and I can ask people questions and hope they'll answer in certain ways or try to guide them in certain ways, but they, it's a little unpredictable. Right. And then I have to take that raw material and carve it down into a story. Right. And some of the things we talk about just don't fit. Right. Um, well, that's how like writing a book is. I'm not sure how making an album is, but I just, I feel like uh, when I, I want to write a book, here's my outline, but as I write it, I realize like, oh, this isn't really exactly what I thought it was gonna be. Mm -hmm. It's a different book. And so it changes slightly. You know, the content may still, the overriding themes may be the same, but the like you know the um, the one or two major themes may be the same, but but their little pieces will have to go be rearranged or edited or refined. So that so I find that during the editing process, the revising process, that's when it really comes. That's through. when it comes together. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's why editing. That's why I ended up doing the editing myself. Finally, is it's 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 actually the authoring of the film is the the editing process. Yeah. In this case. So you said that you, you talked to a, a lot of your friends. Is there anyone that uh, you were surprised that you were able to get a hold of? Oh, of course. Like, yeah, like, like, absolutely. Like, who did you get a hold of that you were like, oh, like no way. Tim Berners-Lee is the ultimate example of, I had never in a million years thought I, that was going to happen. Yeah. And it actually got shot down the first time I tried to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I talked to, um, I tried to get to him through, um, through one channel, just one friend that knew him a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it did not it wasn't going anywhere. Like it was kind of, uh, he has some, he has layers of, of, uh, folks that surround him because, you know, you can imagine that if you were somebody who'd changed the world and you created the world wide web, like Tim Berners Lee, a lot of people want to talk to you about stuff like the news requests and all of that. Right. Like if an, any newspaper is writing a story about the web and they could get a hold of Tim Berners Lee to comment, they would. Right. Yeah. So he has sort of like layers of protection. And the first Avenue I went through, um, tried like did a valiant effort but it wasn't it didn't seem to be going anywhere mm -hmm. and then we had this incredible thing where um we <laughs> matt braun who works here at bearded with me he's a designer at bearded matt braun was at thanksgiving dinner i think with his family and his brother-in-law was there mm -hmm. uh, or half brother-in-law really but he was his, his wife's half brother was there um and and there he's brian and he and brian are talking and I forget how it came up. I think it was because we were featured, Bearded was featured in Net Magazine, and his wife, Jen, was like, oh, Brian, you know, uh, Matt's, Matt's um, studio was featured in Net Magazine, Bearded was featured in Net Magazine. And Brian goes, that's weird. I was just featured in Net Magazine. And Matt was like, well, what do you do? And he was like, well, I, 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 I'm an advocate for, um, for JavaScript and um, do a lot of work with W3C. Um, also works for Apollo Group. And... He's like, what do you do? And he's like, well, I'm a partner at Bearded um, here in Pittsburgh. And he's like, oh, that's weird. Um, hey, aren't you guys making that documentary about the web? Yeah. And Braun was like, yeah. And he's like, I also wrote the, ex the extensibility mani uh, web <laughs> extensibility manifesto. Um, we need to talk. We need to talk about this movie. And he's like, oh, okay. So he puts me in touch with Brian. He comes over and I'm telling Brian, mm -hmm. oh, I was trying to get Tim Berners-Lee. It would have been so great, but it seems like I, don't, I haven't heard anything in months. I don't know what's going on. And Brian just starts texting. Yeah. And I'm like, like, what's going on over there? And he goes, all right, um, that deal's dead. That's not going to work. They already shot it down. They refused it. And I'm like, how do you know that? And he's like, well, I just texted like Tim's people. Yeah. And he's like, but I think I can fix this. Let me, let me see what I can do. And within a week, he, he um, well, he ended up going to New York to a tag meeting, um, the web architecture group, right, um, W3C, which Tim is part of. And Brian came along and um, he's not on the tag, but he knows those folks. And he went and he was talking with Tim and he just pitched it at Tim. Yeah. He's like, look, Tim, it's Kickstarter funded. There's no corporations involved. This is like people's history of the web. This is the pe people of the web making their own web documentary about the web. And of course, Tim, like that's music to his ears, right? Yeah. That's like his vision of the web. Right. So when he pitched that to me, he was like, okay, I'm in, tell him I'm in. And so he was like, great. And he went back to Tim, Tim told his people, I'm, I'll do that documentary. And suddenly they were emailing me and like scheduling and like it just all happened all of a sudden. Oh, nice. Nice. So it was, that was amazing. But it all happened because Matt Brown's brother-in-law knows <laughs> Tim Berners-Lee. They didn't even know they both worked on the web. Yeah. They've known each other for years, right? Right. Oh, man. Uh, so that was just incredible happenstance. So the, Tim was one of them. The power of Thanksgiving, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was, it was terrifying, too. It was terrifying meeting Tim. I mean, he's a wonderful person. He's not terrifying, but I was... It's like meeting Santa Claus, right? Oh, yeah, like, like anyone. Like you just like you, you heard about the person, and like you said, like someone who's changed the, the face of the human history 
Pretty and much. Anyone who's listening to this podcast, he gave you your job. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, it's it's intense. Not not to mention the fact that he like like you said, he just changed the the world. All right. So, how much of his interview is on the cutting room floor? Um, lots. Yeah, <laughs> lots of everybody's is on the cutting room floor. Okay, I was joking. But well, yeah. what did you learn from him? Like, what was anything wow. from his conversation? So I kind of blacked out for Tim Berners Lee's interview. Like, uh, I don't remember it. It was the end of a very long day of interviews. Uh, um, yeah. And I was definitely having a panic attack by the time like I got in front of Tim. And I spent most of it just like making sure the cameras were running right. <laughs> and the audio was running. I was getting good levels and the lighting was okay. And like that I wasn't tripping over cords or doing anything stupid. And then just asking him questions and then smiling, going, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, that's great. And I couldn't really like process what he was saying at the time. In retrospect, it went pretty, it went pretty well considering I had no idea what was going on consciously. Um, but he talked, I asked him a lot about, of course, like the inception of the web, um, like just explain to me how you started the web. And that was pretty fascinating. And then we went through a bunch of other stuff and ended on, um, on some of his pet, uh, subjects, which is like, uh, open data, link data, um, and keeping the web open and free and away from corporate control and private control, um, stuff that he's really passionate about. Um, so he has some good stuff. I'd say sort of the beginning, near the beginning when we talk about history of the web mm -hmm. and then later when we talk about where the web needs to evolve to and, um, and keeping the web open and sort of what people can do to help move the web forward. Okay. Cool. Okay. And you, no one's seen that footage yet, right? I mean, no, no, no. Okay. Cool. Yeah. He's not even in the trailer. He's in the tra yeah. He's, that's cool. Like a special guest star. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, with Tim, I mean, and his time is so scheduled that I think I got 20 minutes with him or 30 minutes. Right. And it was like, you start rolling it when he walks in the room and then 30 minutes later, someone's going to come get him. Yeah. There was no time for any, right. anything elaborate. Yeah, I totally uh, understand that. Yeah, I just, yeah, because their time is special. Like, as you said earlier, just layers upon layers just to get to him. And he was definitely booked up. Like, he was there for a conference for a W3C conference. Mm -hmm. I was just actually the extensible web conference, I think. But then they were also having W3C meetings there. So it was like he was like moving between obligations the whole time, <laughs> doing real stuff, right. deciding what the web should be in 50 years or whatever. Yeah. yeah. You know, Nothing big. Lunch talk, you know, pretty much. You, lunch talk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so some of your, some of your themes are, um, if, if, if these are your themes, let me know if they're not. But like, is legacy of graphic design one of them or is that? Because I'm reading off your outline oh. from your presentation. Is that? Oh, yeah. Okay. So there's a presentation, too. And the presentation I'm beginning, it's called iWeb Designer. I made that talk because it's stuff I find really interesting, okay. of the footage, but that doesn't work into the overall narrative of the film. Oh, nice. Nice. So yeah. it's totally separate. It's, I mean, I have like, I don't know. I have, I have many, many, many hours. Right. I think I have like 30 interviews ranging from like uh, 30 minutes to two hours. Mm. So it's a lot. It's a crap ton of I, okay. like four terabytes of interviews. So this this is called a i i web design. Is that what it or what? I, I comma web designer. I web designer, and, and uh, it's meant to explore what it means to be a web designer. Now I talked with lots of web designers or right. people who fall into various camps, right. and uh, is this, that's. Is this but that's not the, sorry. But sorry. That, oh, that's just not the film. Okay, cool, awesome. Well, I would say like so. Are you? This is the same way you gave at Responsible Web Design Summit mm -hmm. this year, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh man. So I just want to say, like, I was, I was really, you know, I've been on the web since forever, and I was just like, I was just re-energized by by the presentation. So I was just like, yes, you know, just pound through, like, yes, I want to go and and like, well, I think my comment was like, I want to see this every day, every morning, <laughs> and then I know what to do for the rest of the day. Like, yes, I know exactly. I, uh, it has importance and stuff like that. Um, so, and you're giving this talk, which is not the film, but it's just the talk. Uh, are you still giving that rest of the year and work with people? Yeah, I'm. I'm still giving it right now. I'm gonna. I'm going to do it at um, Front End Conference down in Saint Petersburg, Florida, in oh, a nice. few weeks. Right. Um, I just gave it at Converge in uh, South Carolina, okay. and uh, I think I'm doing it at Giant uh, oh. UX. Nice. I'm gonna do it at. Um, abstractions here in Pittsburgh, new conference here in Pittsburgh. We're actually premiering the film here in Pittsburgh right. um, in August. And I 
think that's it for the moment, but it's certainly open to do it some more. I think it's a, it's a talk where it's, it bounces between me giving a traditional presentation with slides mm -hmm. and inter collections of interviews with people from across the web design cool. spectrum. So people like uh, designers like um, Trent Walton or Senia Perez Cruz uh, or uh, like younger people, like people closer to my age, and also um, folks from uh, earlier days of the web who are still doing incredible things but have more sense of the history. So like Adaptive Path founders Indy Young and uh, Peter Merholtz mm -hmm. and Irene Au, who of you know er early Yahoo and then Google fame and now at Kozla Ventures. Um, and Kelly Goto and, right. and, and lots, of, lots of great folks. Right. Um, from just sort of across the web design spectrum, whether they're more UX or IA or more design focused, visual design focused. Um, there are just so many, for me as a designer, like really fun interviews in that niche um, that I felt like I had to use it in some way, even if they weren't going to hit the movie okay. proper. Cool. cool. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely recommend checking it out if you can. It uh, was a great talk. So um, oh, what are the major themes that, that you have, if, if I may get a sneak peek as to sure. the themes? I think the theme of the web of the web documentary is really about uh, what makes the web special and something that we all love and what that frequently comes down to is openness and access and the sort of flexibility and messiness and humanness of the web um, when i was talking to eric meyer recently i think he put it really well which is in a lot of ways the the web is the most human of technological inventions um, it almost feels to me like this sort of underdogish, like uh, ramshackle character that's kind of limping through its history, you know. Um, but you're you're rooting for it because it has so many. It feels so personal and feels like it. It has so much it can do. Like the web has so many problems. Like it's kind of shitty in a lot of ways, right? Like it's not like a beautiful architecture. It's not like a lot of its code is rough. Like Brandon Ike who created JavaScript will tell you how bad JavaScript is. Mm -hmm. Like there, there are all these, and he, and he does in the film that it's, there's lots of bad stuff about the web, mm -hmm. but it persists and it, it, and it's also incredible and magical. And mostly it comes down to the visionary core of the web that Tim Berners-Lee came up with that you can link to stuff. You can find things at URLs and these, these sort of platform agnostic URLs that give you access to content. You can link things together. And that superpower of the web has enabled it to keep going, even though there are, you know, people thought or suggested native apps had killed the web um, not long ago. Um, because in a lot of ways, they're better. They're always on, they're in your pocket, they're on your phone, they have faster, more exciting user experiences and user interfaces. Um, they can have access to hardware level stuff that the web previously didn't have access to. Um, but the problem is they're all siloed on these devices. Like it's an iOS app, it's an Android app. They're not part of this larger, as Tim Berners-Lee would say, the larger discourse of the web. You can't just link to it and go there and everyone can see it and comment on it and link back to it. And that versatility, that ubiquitousness, that messiness of the web is what makes it so flawed and yet so exciting and persistent. Um, so it, it's really about that story of the web, um, that core value of the web, that openness, that connectedness, um, that sharing of the web uh, and the cultures that surround it and the people that surround it, um, taking it through a bit of a history of how it came to be um, and some of the the interesting trajectories that it took um, where we've seen the web get pushed and pulled in lots of different directions and take lots of different diversions, but ultimately come back to that place of openness. So for instance, like flash would be a really good example of where the web almost sort of fell off the cliff there with flash. Mm -hmm. The web almost got eaten by flash for a while, um, partly because the web was stalled out and stagnated um, and flash was innovating and flash was doing what, um, the people building the web wanted. Um, and it gave them a place to, to do things like audio or video or animation or, 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 and it also united the browsers in a weird way, you know? Right. Um, so going through that sort of trajectory and then ultimately coming back to where we are now, which is, um, back to that core, um, URL based web system, and then exploring where things need to go next and where they're going in the future with concepts like progressive web apps, for instance. Right. Yeah, it just seems like every um, like uh, Kyle Simpson, who's uh, get a yeah. on the web, he always says mm -hmm. uh, bet on JavaScript. 
That was, was, <laughs> was like, he'll, he'll always bet on JavaScript. I, ha I have a really quick Kyle uh, Simpson interview in there, actually. Oh, really? I caught him when I was in San Francisco at, at that conference, the O'Reilly conference. Yeah. Um, and it was one of those things where I just had like half of my setup. I like, took the BART there. Like, I didn't have my full rig. And I was just kind of shooting at the conference. But then somebody was like, hey, Kyle's here. You should get an interview. And we just ran up to a conference room at the end and shot a few minutes. But he said a few pretty smart things about JavaScript. I like him a lot. He's a very smart guy. So, so Several people at that conference described JavaScript as like the back door of the web. Because it, it's, and Brandon Ike actually interviewed him. He said, like, he intended it to be that way from the beginning. He knew there were things he was going to get wrong. He was going to write crappy code. He did it in a hurry. He knew the web was going to evolve beyond what he had conceived of for JavaScript. Right. So he made sure that people could go back and change it and re architect um, through JavaScript. Like, it should be the trapdoor mm -hmm. that lets you fix all the broken things. Oh, nice. Well, yeah, I just, uh, like, one of my factoids is like, what is this? Uh, Adobe, before they bought Flash. Mm hmm. Uh, the piece, uh, reason why we have PDF is because uh, Adobe like looked at the web and said, as "I'm paraphrasing. I'm like, I'm like classing shade on Adobe, whatever." But I was just like, <laughs> but they they thought like, "Hey, we could actually make PDFs, and that's sort of like the web, and you don't have to deal with all these weird things like not having typefaces that you want, because like, you know, before we can really embed type and all that stuff." So there was a point in time where we're like, we were like the web could have been. Just a bunch of PDFs that we give out to people, and so like, and so, and it's, it's, there have been a few clips we almost fell off of. Yeah, you know, exactly. it could have become PDFs, it could have become Flash, it could have become, yeah. uh, it could have become native apps, right? right? Yeah, and it still could become other things. But um, Eric Meyer put it really well um, when I interviewed him recently, which was that it, the web prizes um, ubiquity. Mm. That's like its superpower, and other. Other platforms like Flash um, prize consistency. Like Flash wanted everything to be the same. If you have Flash Player, it always looks the same. Right. Okay. Don't have Flash Player, you get nothing. Right. And the web is different. The web says, um, here's the stuff of this URL. We're going to try and load that stuff in some fashion. Right. The There's web is, yeah, the web is never perfect. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The web is never perfect. That's what. Uh, I don't even know what perfect. On the web, like I don't know what the perfect circumstance is for the things that I've created. Like I couldn't tell you what's the ideal way to view the thing, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's I mean, having I mean. JavaScript on would be nice. Yeah, it would be nice. <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah, I, find it's, I, I just like the fact that it's so uh, it is. It's not modular. I guess not molded. I guess I'm not sure which one. It has mold. I think that's another one. No, not it. No, um, that it could change so much, and that we have responsible design, and so the definition of a web page is totally different. Than it used to be. So it's pretty cool. one of my favorite moments right now in the film actually is um, the, when we talk about Ethan unveiling responsive design um, as just some one of these pivotal moments because people who were there get so excited to talk about it. Oh, and yeah. I have Kevin Kevin Sharon and Eric Meyer both talk, they were both there and talking about what it was like when Ethan walked on stage and unveiled responsive design. Um, it was an event apart 2010 I think in Seattle. Mm. And they and Eric Meyer and um, Dan Cederholm were both talking about media queries and just sort of like as these obscure things that um, were like, isn't this kind of neat? Look at this media query. You could maybe do some things with it. And then they both got off stage and then Ethan walked up and like, oh, by the way, lays out responsive design. <laughs> he like lays it down. You know, here are the three parts of this thing. I've, I'm calling it responsive design. Look what it does when you change the size of the browser. And the whole place just went nuts, of course. Like, yeah. it, it, uh, Eric Meyer, I think, described it as, like, completely a, a electric. That, like, people were just getting more and more electrified as the talk went on. They're all going, yeah, yeah, this is it. This is the thing. This is important. This is a big, big change. Um, and I think reflecting on that, that sort of pivotal moment of Ethan, like, bringing those things together, um, it's pretty fun to watch them walk through that. Uh, so, w w where do you go from there? From that point, we talked about like how pivotal a moment that was. Like, um, yeah, I mean that we. So we we. It's the aftermath of that moment, right? right? It's how it changed everything that we do. Um, and I think uh, it's it's really that that particular moment, the the post unveiling moment, is really well summarized by uh, actually Trent, two guys, Trent Walton and Paul Boag. Um, cause both of them had similar responses. I think that you had a similar response too, but it just would have been too many people saying the same thing. But it was like, like, I hate this. 
was their baby. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Like, this is terrible. Yeah. I don't want to do it. This is, this is awful. This is too hard. I don't want to do this. I like what I'm doing. Uh-huh. I like making these pixel perfect websites in Photoshop all by myself and then handing them off and it's done and it's great and everybody loves it. And can we please stop changing things? Um, Paul Boag put it well. He said um, he knew it was right, right from the beginning. There's no denial for him. He just didn't want to do it. Right. He just dived into a deep depression because he couldn't imagine handling another big thing like that. Mm-hmm. But then, of course, you do it, and he pulled himself up and did it, and now it's great. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it changed everything. We all had to completely change our processes, you know? Yeah, stuff. Yeah, which is totally cool and fun. Yeah, I mean, it gave us something to do, right? I, I mean, right. frankly, I was getting bored. I was, I, was re- I was totally ready for an earthquake. I was like, oh, when that man. came out, I was like, yes, I get to reimagine everything that I do. Man. Thank goodness this was starting to, yeah. to, to grind a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, I guess the personality thing. So do, can you t- t- give us a lot more insights of where, where else you go with, with the movie, with, the, with your interviews? Sure. Um, yeah, so there's that that whole. I guess before that, I could move back a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, talking about the earlier days of the web is really. It was really fun for me to talk to people that experienced stuff that I was really on the periphery for. Mm-hmm. You know, where I was in. Um, you know, so I'm 38. So that means I started college in like 96. I actually, it's complicated, but I was I went to college in 95. Um, but. Uh, at that point, that was my first email address, like my Telnet email address. And right around that time, like 94 to 96 is when I started first experiencing the web. Um, before that, though, in middle school, like I was on BBSs and like all that nerdy stuff. But the web web, I didn't really know until around 95, okay. I'd say, maybe 94. Um, and I got to do things like um, go try to find websites about bands that I liked that I didn't know anything about because they were too small, like nobody knew. And then you find like a fan site, and, oh my God, there's a picture of the band. That's what they look like. Because yeah. other people are listening to this music and got those exciting experiences. And then of course I'd print out those web pages and take them home. <laughs> that's, that's what you do at the web. You print out the whole web and you take it home. Yeah, that's what you did. Like you, you, you print out MapQuest and yep. you took it to your car. So you could drive oh it. man, I used to, because I used to go on tour with bands at that time and I would print out binders of MapQuest. Yeah. Take it on tour because even phones, I didn't even have a cell phone then. I had, I had phone cards so I could call my girlfriend or whatever. Yeah. Um, but any, anyhow, so like that early days of web, hearing that from people that were like involved with that. So I got to talk with Chris Wilson for quite a while, oh, who's nice. now at Google. But yeah, Chris Wilson is amazing. Um, I mean, he worked on the uh, Windows version of Mosaic. So almost one, one of the first iterations of the web browser, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly the first like commercial web browser. Um, so Mosaic, which ended up basically kind of sort of turning into Netscape, which we all know and, and love, right? I love Mosaic. Uh, that was an awesome browser. Yeah. So yeah, you talk, you, you actually have you in the movie talking about how great Mosaic is. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's cutting back and forth with Chris Wilson. So that should make you happy. Okay, yeah. Hearing Chris talk about like being this college student with a flock of seagulls haircut, like working <laughs> in a basement at the... <laughs> National Center for Supercomputing and Aeronautic? What? Not Aeronautics, that's NASA. Um, NCSA, National Computer, what? I don't know. Well, you know what I'm talking about. You, somebody will get it right. Yeah, we'll get it right. In the comments. <laughs> um, anyway, the, he, he was working there, right? And he's a kid in the basement, college kid in the basement, working on Mosaic, and they push it out, and they start watching. They've got, like, a feed of the downloads going on this monitor and they see that they get like a hundred downloads and he starts losing his mind because he's like, Oh my God, a hundred people are using our browser. Right. Yeah. And then he, you know, of course now he works on Chrome and like, right. They get like a hundred thousand downloads a second or something silly like that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's still like the scale of that. Right. So just like, I thought it was amazing. Like, I don't know. You probably, I was probably, you probably heard me talk about this already during our interview, but that just still never, and it probably should, but that never really ceases to amaze me that we can publish anything we want. We don't need a blog. We don't need WordPress or anything. We just publish it to the web, like some HTML, like text document. And if it's important enough, if it's great content or if it's of value, it can be shared through anyone over the, over the world. And at the time, I was like trying to, when I went to school, I was like trying to be a, uh, a print designer for a local newspaper. Because I thought, like, that's great. We can design things. It'll be shared by a local community uh, of, like, millions of people, like, a couple millions of people in the city. But now, like, screw that. We can go, for, like, 
the web is awesome. We could design for the whole world. Not that the whole world will come see it, but you know, there's a chance that you could work on a project that's like, like work for Microsoft, work for a global company, and like your work is shared all over the world. So, like, it's I mean, it's pretty incredible. And the I think web is awesome, is what I'm trying to say, Matt. And that, I'm with you. <laughs> I am going to have to agree with you there. Okay. And, but that's what those those early days like. They didn't know that yet. Mm-hmm. Like they didn't, they knew, they maybe imagined the potential. Right. But for Chris, it was like, holy shit, a hundred people are using Mosaic right now. Right. That's awesome. And then it just took off. And then that was the beginning. Like that was the beginning of that. Holy shit. Look at all these people. Oh, wow. And then it just, it, it really took off from there. Wow. You know, it's pretty exciting. And of course he ended up working on Internet Explorer for many versions, I think. Right. Um, I also got to talk with uh, Tontek Chalik about oh, awesome. that a bit, right? Another, another great early guy. And when I say they're early guys, they're still current guys as well. Like that's not uh, to say that they did something and now they're you know dinosaurs or something. Like yeah. they're they're still doing amazing things. Right. Um, Chris actually, when I was there, he demoed Web MIDI, which is a spec he's been working on, and he busted out a, a USB keytar ah. plugged into his computer, <laughs> and he played Van Halen's Jump for me on a uh, MIDI synthesizer that he wrote in a browser, oh, and it blew my mind. Oh wow. I was so excited. I have video of it. It's great. Oh, that's awesome. That's like you better have video of that. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, so like really, for me, there, there were like a lot of really pivotal experiences just for me personally making the movie. Mm-hmm. One is just getting a richer understanding of the history of the web and the things that happened that got us where we are now. Mm-hmm. The things that were sort of similar um, pivotal moments to, to my experience with responsive design um, were really cool um, to hear about. And just to to see what sort of like the, the core of the web was for people. And I think really latching onto that idea that it's all about the URL, that the URL is the center that everything sort of spools out from. It's, it's sort of the, the technical and the spiritual center of the web, right? Um, and as long as we stay focused on that, on that connectedness and that linkability and that sharing of and connecting of content and data, um, we're, we're probably going to go in a good place with the web. So the main thing is just never look, never give up our URLs, basically. Or yeah, else, right. Lose our identities. Is that pretty much it? Like, it's kind of, yeah, yeah. Stay true to yourself, right? Yeah. And for the web, I mean, I think if you think about like what's gone well and what's not gone well in the web's history, um, one of the sort of litmus tests for that is does it um, stay true to the URL or not? Hmm. Um, and I think when you start blocking things, walling off content, uh, as you see, certainly in a world like the App Store world, right, where you've got these very, very contained worlds where you have a gatekeeper, a corporate gatekeeper that's telling you whether or not you can publish content, that's totally antithetical to the web, right? Yeah. Um, or, or disassociating content from a URL. If something's published entirely within a native application, um, there's no access to it from the web. You can't link to it. You can't talk about it. It's just sort of stuck. You know, it's not part of that larger discourse, right? In your, um, in, your, in your interviews, did, did anyone say it's like an all or nothing type of thing, or did someone like? No, because they're right? they're shades of gray, right? They're they're the sort of like semi closed systems of say social networks like Facebook, mm-hmm. where everyone on Facebook that's within your connections and privacy settings can get at that content. Right. Not everyone to get in that content. Not to say that all the content should be free and open. Like there are things that I don't want the world to see, you know. So I think it's nuanced, um, but as much as possible. I mean, I think making data open um, and connectable is what makes the web great. And I think it's one thing to say, like, I don't want the world to see my kids' baby pictures, right? Like, that's fine. But when we start just by default handing over the keys to the kingdom and saying, um, we'll let Facebook worry about whether or not um, this content is, is something that needs to be connected or shared or open uh, or not, we'll let them make that decision. Um, that starts to become kind of problematic and something we should maybe be concerned about a little bit. Cool. That's great. I think it's a good spot to end the uh, <laughs> talking about your movie. When, when <laughs> tell me more about the premiere. It's August. Sure, it's going to be August nineteenth, uh, uh, Let me let me look it up. You know what? Yeah. Let me some typing noises for a second here. Um, but it's at the Abstractions Conference in okay. Pittsburgh. Okay. Um, and that's, oh, sorry, you got it right, 18th to 20th. I'm not sure which day it is yet, but it'll okay. be at that conference. Okay. And um, 
then not long after that, we I will be throwing it up on the web. I shouldn't say throwing it up. That's <laughs> not, I'm going to like barf it on the web. Publish. Kind of. I'm going to upload it. I'm going to upload it to the no, web. Distribute is what the film people say. say, say. Yeah, I will. It will distribute. Be, Digitally distributed <laughs> okay. um, through through the Vimeo platform, okay. um, very Vimeo, and it will be password protected. And I will give that password to everyone who funded on Kickstarter. Okay. So that's the reward for Kickstarter: is early access to the film. Okay. Um, and then eventually, I will open that up publicly for everyone ever free. Okay. Uh, so there will be a little bit of delay just to reward the Kickstarters, and also um, just for fun, so I can like go around and and screen it at various organizations. So any organizations that are interested in screening it mm -hmm. can contact me through either the Bearded website at bearded.com, through the contact page, or through Twitter or whatever. And I'm starting a spreadsheet of various organizations, so like design organizations or UX organizations or development meetups uh, anywhere in the world um, that want to screen it. After that August date, I'm going to allow them to do a screening. Um, I'll give them a high, uh, an HD download from Vimeo where they can do that and show it to their groups. Okay. Um, and... If people want me to come and do Q and A or talk about it, um, that's certainly up for negotiations too. Okay. Um, especially if they can help pay for travel, that's kind of nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm open to doing that kind of thing too. So I've already had a few casual contacts through Twitter. Oh, uh, nice. People do that, but I think that would be fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just really, I mean, my my whole point of doing this is I got an opportunity to talk to these incredible people and have really fascinating conversations, and it really changed the way I look at my career and the medium in which I work. And if I, I, I really think it was a unique moment in my life that will never be replicated. <laughs> I got to fly all over the place having these fascinating conversations with the best people I could talk to, you know. Um, and as much as I can share that with everyone else on the web and let them enjoy as much of it as possible too, um, that's why I'm putting the movie out there and that's why it's just going to be free and streamable, you know. Cool. Awesome. Well, let's, uh, as a person on the web, I appreciate that. Oh, to good. Open yeah. and, and, and distribute the film. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, how else can you distribute a film about the web? Except, yeah. yeah, exactly. I give it a URL. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how can people find you on the internet? Um, you can go to my company's website, bearded.com, mm. or you can go to the movie website, futureisnext.com, or you can find me on Twitter at either uh, the username Bearded Studio or I am Elephant Press. That's a tough one. E L E F O N T P R E S S. Don't ask. And the third one is Future is Next. That's the movie on Twitter. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Christopher. Always a pleasure. Cool.